please know I am but a humble raven puff and do not own or take credit for any of the magical fan fictions on this podcasting channel. Nor do I own any rights or magical say on J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter characters that are mentioned within these stories. These fan fictions are the result of much more creative and dedicated minds than my own, and I will be introducing these authors as well as where to find their other works at the beginning of every episode. Hello, my magical brethren, and welcome to Fox's Fix, a podcast that attempts the sonorous charm on some of your favorite Harry Potter fan fictions. So whether you're taking the night bus across town, denoming your garden, or simply shopping through Diagon Alley, this is a podcast that allows even the busiest witches and wizards a chance to listen to their favorite fan fiction. So I'd say it's time we take a page out of Fox's book and light up this week's fan fiction. Fox's Fix presents the unabridged audiobook of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. Bex Chan's novel-length fanfiction can be located on fanfiction.net as well as archiveofourown.org. Warning, this fanfiction is rated mature for its explicit language, content, and themes. Chapter 11. Doubt. Fucking hell. This was hard. So hard. After the longest night in his life, during which he hadn't managed a second of sleep, Draco was basking in the morning sun, seeping in through the window. He felt blurry today, weary with insomnia, and still confused and agitated about the incident with Granger. In a random moment of spontaneity, He stripped away all his clothes to see if the cold air or the warm rays of sun would make him feel more alive again, more real. But even then, he still felt like a ghost. A flimsy creature on the crest of reality, but not quite there. It must have been pushing into sociable hours because he could hear Granger starting to stir and a pained cringe stole his face. This was what he'd been dreading and yet waiting for all night, his favorite part of his degrading routine. A sheer gloss of sweat broke out across his naked skin, and he listened to her move into the bathroom. When he thought he caught a dash of taste in his mouth, that sensitive spot under his stomach twitched. A fucking gen. He tried to shove it away, but his head was too muddled to really resist the pull of his body. He heard what he assumed was her clothes thudding to the floor, and he gulped down a throaty swallow. Closing his sleep-deprived eyes, his imagination inflicted him with colorful and dangerous images of her. He succumbed to them quickly, though, too tired to put up a decent fight, and too captivated by the fantasies to ignore them. It was so hard. He was so hard. Having indulged in many a sexual fantasy, this one was different. Simple, and without unnecessary exaggeration. In his head, Granger was exactly how she should be with her must curls around her shoulders and a thoughtful expression on her familiar features. Her body, well, he had no idea if the image matched the subject, but he would guess he was close as his subconscious began to discard items of her clothing. He heard the shower start to run, and he inhaled a shaky breath as his hand shifted lower and lower down his stomach. He was too far gone to heed the Slytherin voice in his skull and realize what he was doing, and any whispers of doubt were kicked aside as her first bathroom purrs reached his ears. Keeping his eyes firmly shut and focusing on the fantasy Granger's lips, he grabbed the steel-stiff length below his navel. Merlin's soul. Draco needed this. He needed it bad. In his head, Granger was in the shower now, and he tightened his fist and began to pump away his tension. Weeks and months without release 
let him know he wouldn't last long. But he didn't care. He didn't give a shit that his head was full of forbidden thoughts of her or that his room was, as always, clogged with her addictive scent. It didn't matter that the witch was a catalyst to his lustful strain, nor did it matter that he made his fantasy granger slip her own hand between her thighs to accompany her next shower moan. The image sent him over the edge, and a husky sigh-come-roar thundered through his throat as the hot fluid splashed across his abdomen. His eyes fluttered open, and fantasy granger simmered away from his mind leaving him satisfied and panting like an arctic fox who had just snagged his prey, or a mate. His heart was drumming against his ribcage as he tried to gather his wits, blinking away some of the beads of sweat tucked between his eyelashes. The high didn't last long, but then it never did, and what was left behind was self-disgust that was physically painful. He wiped away the remains of his orgasm with a pair of boxers and turned over. Curling up in a defeated semi-fetal position, he could feel the cold clawing over his skin now, but he didn't cover himself with a blanket. Cold brought reality back that little bit quicker. There was no excuse for what he'd just done. And the worst thing was, He had no idea if he wanted to slam his skull against the wall until his imagination tumbled out of his ears or give himself another ride. This time, he didn't cover his head with a pillow to block her out. He should have done it, but he didn't. Instead, he let her shower sounds numb his brain and distract him from his harsh reality. He just masturbated to Hermione Granger, the mudblood. Fuck. He rolled over and grabbed the nearest thing to him, the muggle book by the king bloke. He turned it over in his hands and analyzed the cover for the hundredth time, recalling their discussion about prejudices and the trap he'd walked straight into. Curse her to the veil and back, but it had made him think. If only for a moment, he had wondered how he would really see her if it weren't for her dirty heritage. And now, he was doing it again. How would he see her without her dirty blood? Double fuck. Neville had pretty much dragged her to dinner in the Great Hall, ignoring her protests and insisting that some time amongst friends would cheer her up. Apparently, the distress about her flashbacks of Malfoy's lips was scrawled blatantly across her face, as Neville usually left her in her melancholy alone. Neville commented that she looked worse today, and she'd eventually agreed to join him and the others reasoning that some lazy banter might actually distract her from the ugly truth. And an ugly truth it was. Brokenly beautiful, in an odd way. Just like Draco. How could she have kissed him? She was sat on the outskirts of the small crowd, finishing a paragraph of an assignment that she could have waited until later to do. She lifted her head and glanced around the group, moving her distant gaze across Ginny, Lavender, Dean, and Seamus, and back to Neville at her side, frowning when she realized someone was missing. Neville, she mumbled quietly, keeping her voice low to avoid interrupting the other's conversation. Where's Luna? We noticed that too, he told her. She disappears at lunch sometimes, and I don't think she stays here at weekends either. One of the fifth years says she saw her leaving the ground Saturday. Where does she go? I don't know, he shrugged. None of us do. She must have permission from McGonagall, though. Well, that's odd, Hermione sighed, turning away when one of the other boys said something that caught her attention. 
What did you say, Seamus? I was talking about the rumors going around, he answered with a whisper, leaning in so only the six of them could hear. A lot of people think that Voldemort is going to infiltrate the Ministry soon. Hermione raised a skeptical brow. Rumors are just that, Seamus. I wouldn't pay too much attention. It could be true, though, he insisted. And if they get control of the Ministry, they get control of Hogwarts, and we will all be fucked. Emphasis on the if, she said calmly. If McGonagall thought Hogwarts was at risk, she would have figured out an alternative location for us by now. Who's to say she isn't thinking of that? He shot back quickly. And where else would we go? My mom said it could happen. And your mom also believed in all that rubbish they wrote about Harry and the Prophet. Hermione reminded him, rising from her seat. There are a lot of rumors going around at the moment. Let's just stick to what we know. Where are you going, Hermione? Ginny asked, looking a little disappointed as the brunette gathered her things. You haven't finished your food. I'm not hungry, Hermione offered weakly, giving her friend an apologetic look. And I need to see McGonagall. Well, the redhead continued, if you'd like, you can come pop up to the tower tonight, or I could come visit you. No, Hermione argued quickly, cringing at the urgency to her tone. No, no, my dorm is a complete mess. I'll try and come see you later. She gave the other Gryffindors a polite nod before she turned away and left the Great Hall. Calculating, she had a good thirty minutes left to see the headmistress before her lessons started. She walked with long and quick strides to McGonagall's office and muttered the password to let herself in, knowing the older witch usually stayed here during dinner hour. Miss Granger, the older witch greeted from her desk, this is quite unexpected. Is everything okay? You look a little down today. Malfoy. Hermione hesitated and settled into the seat opposite to the headmistress, pursing her lips in thought. I'm... I'm not sure, she murmured. I guess... I guess I have some questions I need to ask you. Very well, McGonagall nodded leaning back and giving her student her full attention. What is bothering you? Well, Hermione started awkwardly, wondering just where to begin. Seamus mentioned that there was some talk about Voldemort infiltrating the Ministry, and I was just wondering if there's any truth to that. The witch tensed her mouth and exhaled a long and weary breath. There has been talk since Dumbledore died. The headmistress admitted. However, not much detail is known. All I can tell you is that it is a possibility. Hermione felt something in her chest sink. And if it does come true, then we will have to evacuate many of the students, McGonagall supplied with a sad tone. Particularly muggle-borns like yourself. Oh God! Try not to worry so much about it. McGonagall advised warmly. As far as we can tell, the Ministry is holding up fine against the Death Eaters, and we have precautionary measures in place if the worst were to happen. Hermione folded her arms around herself, suddenly feeling very cold and alone. A part of her had always suspected that the Ministry could be affected by Voldemort, but it was so easy to lose track of everything outside of Hogwarts, when she was buried in her books or involved with confusing lip locks with someone she shouldn't be. I'm not having much luck with trying to figure out what the other Horcruxes are, Hermione whispered with loud disappointment. I've been trying to see if I can find a link between the diary and the ring with any other objects that would make sense. And we know the locket is one, but we just don't know where the real one is, and... Miss Granger, the headmistress interjected her rant. I am well aware that you are trying your hardest, as well as Mr. Potter and Mr. Weasley. I am sure it will come eventually. You must not get too stressed. There is going to be a war soon, and... We have technically been at war for months, Miss Granger. 
McGonagall interrupted again. Well, the final front then, Hermione clarified with frustration and unease. I can feel it coming, and I don't know if we will find all the horcruxes in time. We are all doing our best to prepare, McGonagall said, giving the young witch a sullen look. Hermione, there is only so much you can do. Remember that you are human, dear. You are doing brilliantly, and I could ask no more of you. Please try not to get so stressed. It won't help. The hazel-eyed witch released a forlorn sigh, but yielded to McGonagall's logic and soothing words. It wasn't the first time she'd had a pseudo-panic fit in the headmistress's presence, and it probably wouldn't be the last. Most of the order members, and even some of her fellow students had been subjected to many breakdowns as of yet. It was only natural considering the current climate, and Hermione was grateful that her professor could always calm her volatile thoughts, even if it was only temporary. Do you feel better now, Miss Granger? McGonagall asked. Or do you have another question? I have a thousand questions, she breathed, pausing to consider before a thought fluttered into her mind as she remembered what Neville had told her. Actually, there is something I'm a little curious about. Go ahead, McGonagall encouraged. Neville mentioned that Luna had been leaving Hogwarts on the weekends, Hermione explained, frowning when the headmistress averted her eyes. Can you tell me why? I'm sorry, Miss Granger, but I cannot, McGonagall said after a pensive pause. I can confirm that Miss Lovegood does leave the premises at weekends but she has told me her reason in strict confidence, and I assured her that I wouldn't tell anyone. Is she okay? Hermione questioned. She's not in any trouble or anything? She is absolutely fine, the elder witch replied. I can assure you that she is completely safe. Then why is she? It is a personal matter, McGonagall finalized briskly. And if you want to know more... You shall have to ask Miss Lovegood herself. The Hogwarts pupils were scattered randomly around the library, squeezed between aisles and shelves, and huddled a little closer than normal to fight the cold. The sky was already winter dark at seven o'clock, and Madame Pince had lit a few extra candles and cast a rather weak warming charm to accommodate the forty or so snug students. Hermione sat by herself in a dark corner near the restricted section, lost in a lonely bubble that silenced the surrounding noise. She tried to focus on the scribbled pages in front of her, but once again, she couldn't stop thinking about Malfoy and what had happened between them. How could I have done that? Every method of distraction she'd attempted had failed and left her with itching lips and just more confusion. She wanted to know why and how it had happened, but she could hardly suggest a discussion about it with her Slytherin doormate. What made it worse was she felt like everyone was staring at her, burrowing into her head and stealing her naughty secret and despising her for it. Paranoia was such a parasite. But that wasn't even the worst thing. No matter how much she tried to reject the absurd notion, she couldn't help but think she'd been rather cheated in some way. I mean, it hadn't been a real kiss, and she felt like she'd missed out on some kind of conclusion or climax. It was like she'd been to hell and not experienced the lick of the flames. She shouldn't have wanted to, but she really, really did. Her curiosity was getting the better of her, and she wanted more. She wanted... Hermione? She startled with a harsh gasp and gave the source of the interruption a sharp look. Merlin's grave, Michael, she mumbled, 
You scared me half to death. Sorry. He chuckled casually, in a way that made her think he wasn't sorry at all. I was just wondering if you'd finish the list of duties for the prefix. Oh, she breathed absently, shuffling in her bag for the requested list. Uh, yes, sure, here. Michael Corner accepted the sheet of parchment and gave it a quick scan before he turned back to give her a concerned stare. Are you okay, Hermione? The head boy asked. You seem a little distant. I'm fine, she shrugged, bowing her head to hide her uncertainty. Is there a problem with the rota? No, it looks good, he replied. I just thought you might like some company. Oh, I'll be leaving in a minute, Hermione answered, trying to be polite as she could, despite her foul mood. Sorry, Michael, I'm rather tired. She made a mental note to apologize to him for her sour behavior at a later date. She normally enjoyed light conversation with the Ravenclaw, who had matured exponentially in the past year, particularly after he'd broken up with Cho. Initially, Hermione had been extremely wary of working with him, having heard some rather unflattering comments from Ginny. But he was nice enough, if a bit too competitive at times. It's no worry, he offered weakly, clearing his throat. We need to organize a meeting to discuss the Christmas dance soon. Ugh, is that really necessary? Hermione groaned, slamming her book shut. There are more important things that we should be thinking about than some silly ball. I think McGonagall's just trying to keep spirits up, Michael reminded her. Come on, Hermione. It wouldn't hurt to have a bit of fun on Christmas. The people here need some cheering up. I guess. She sighed skeptically, packing everything into her bag and rising from her seat. We can discuss it at Hogsmeade this week and then. Is that okay? That's fine, he nodded. Would you like me to walk you back to your dorm? No, don't be silly, she dismissed with a wave of her hand. I think Terry and Anthony are trying to call you back anyway. I'll just see you Saturday. Hermione turned away before he could answer and stalked toward the exit, keeping her gaze low to ignore the looks of other students. She would swear they were casting her suspicious glances again, and she hurried away with a heavy heart. Despite her desire to avoid her dorm, or more precisely, the blonde Slytherin who was lingering inside, her strides led her there anyway. She trembled with anxiety as she whispered the password and slipped inside. Her nervous hazel scanned every inch of her quarters critically, but as always, the room gave no indication of his presence, and she quickly concluded that he was in his own room. With a relieved sigh that any confrontation would be postponed for the time being, she rushed towards her room with every intention of hiding away until morning, uncaring that it could be considered cowardly. But she stopped short when three steady knocks tapped against her main door, and she released a startled yelp in response. Merlin, she was on edge. Who, who is it? She called her voice wavering slightly. It's Michael. She frowned at his insistence and fired a cautious look at Malfoy's room, wondering if it was wise to have a visitor when he was supposed to remain unseen. What do you want? She asked loudly, keeping her eyes fixed on Draco's door. I'm a little busy. You left one of your books behind, the head boy explained. Are you okay? Hermione grimaced and slowly headed towards his voice, casting a final glance over her shoulder before she cracked open the door, just enough to prop her head against the frame and keep her body hidden. I was just about to have a shower, she lied when he gave her a puzzled look. I'm in my dressing gown. Sorry, he grinned sheepishly, holding up the book for her to take. Are you certain you're okay, Hermione? You've been acting a little off today. 
she managed to force her mouth into an uncomfortable smile as she plucked her book out of his fingers and chucked it to land on her table. I'm just really tired, she told him, closing the door a little and hoping he would get the hint. I think I'm going to have an early night, but thanks for bringing me my book. Are you sure? He persisted, and she fought hard not to get irritated with him. I'm sure, she said bluntly. Good night. Okay, good night then. I'll see you Saturday. Hermione released a haggard breath as she closed the door and rested her forehead heavily against it, willing the oddly loud thuds in her chest to simmer. She knew that Michael's intentions had been completely innocent, and her reaction had been too defensive. But she just felt like everyone was trying to corner her today. She felt like they were all trying to dive into her thoughts, her secrets, and she just didn't want a soul knowing what she'd done. Who the fuck was that? Her head whipped around so quick she almost lost her balance, and her chest felt ready to tear open when her heart recommenced its wild pounding. She subconsciously retreated until her back was pressed up against the door, and she placed a hand over her heaving chest, fixated on him, as he leaned against his own doorframe with a thunderous expression. Draco's features were contorted into a fascinating mixture of scorn and resentment, and something else that Hermione couldn't quite identify, but it made her breath clog in her throat. Why do you have to do that? She gasped angrily once she found her voice. Do you enjoy scaring the living? I asked you who that was. Draco spat between clenched teeth, and she noticed how tense his muscles were. And you better give me a decent fucking answer, Granger. Hermione flinched as he pushed himself away from his wall and shifted towards her, with slow and calculated movements that reminded her of a wolf. She noticed that Malfoy had defined grace and elegance that she couldn't help but admire and envy, as though every step was intentional and pre-planned to be intimidating or even seductive. She should have found it disconcerting or unpleasant, but Godric forgive her. She couldn't help but be intrigued with every step he took. Are you bloody deaf, Granger? It was just Michael Corner, she murmured, shrugging off her robes and heading to the sofas. He's in our year, and I know who he is, Drago ground out, his tone still low and dark. Dull Ravenclaw, shit Quidditch player. His only redeeming feature is that he's a pureblood. What did he want from you? He was just returning my book, she explained uneasily as he continued to near her, arms folded arrogantly over his chest. Why do you, and why, would that sad little prick think you were meeting him on Saturday? She raised her eyebrows. You were eavesdropping? Just answer the fucking question, he demanded harshly, slamming his palms against the back of the other couch. Why would you be meeting him? What business is it of yours? Draco clicked his jaw and shook his head, like he was catching himself before he did something foolhardy. His storm cloud eyes flickered between her and the floor, while he chewed his tongue and seemed to gather a few soothing breaths. She studied him closely and dampened her lips with a flick of her tongue, waiting nervously for his response. It's my business when he's inviting himself here, Draco answered carefully. If he saw me, he could go shitting that information to everyone. He didn't see you. And if you plan on slagging it around... Then, how dare you? Hermione screamed, rising from her seat and marching towards him. You have no right to talk to me in that manner. I can talk to you however I want, he countered calmly, 
craning his neck to loom over her. And if you don't tell me why you're meeting him, then I'll draw my own conclusions. This is ridiculous, she hissed. I told you I was going to Hogsmeade this weekend, and and you're going with that? He growled, as though the notion revolted him and left a sour taste on his tongue. So you are fucking that repulsive piece of... Oh, for Godric's sake, Malfoy, Hermione shouted, oblivious to how close they were. Michael and I are only going together because we're the heads. Draco's mouth snapped shut with an audible clap, and she felt like he was stripping her with his glare as his eyes darted over her face. She realized just how close he was then, close enough that his breath stirred some of her hairs by her forehead, and she didn't move despite every instinct screeching at her to do so. Think, Hermione. Remember what happened last time you were this close? If he was bothered by their proximity, he didn't budge, and she would swear that something close to relief washed across his pale features. He tilted his head slightly and dropped his shoulders, and the room seemed to fill with static as his earlier rage dissipated. So you're telling me, that useless dickhead is head boy? He drawled skeptically. What a fucking joke. He's actually very good, she argued, noting his upper lip twitch as she spoke. Are we done here, Drake? Malfoy? He frowned at her mistake, and the witch tried to hide her embarrassed flush with little success. She turned to leave, but his cold grip coiled around her wrist before she could get any distance between them. Just shove him away, Hermione, she thought to herself. You guys are too close. Oh, what now? She said aloud, refusing to look back at him. I have answered your questions and put up with enough of your... I'm not finished, he muttered, clenching her arm a little tighter as he spoke. I have another question. Hermione scoffed. I see no reason why I should... Why did you make me food this morning? He rushed out with obvious qualms. Hermione blinked to herself and slowly twisted her neck to give Draco a confused look. What do you mean? She mumbled. I always make you a meal in the morning. I thought after our fight last night, he said reluctantly, that you wouldn't have made, that you wouldn't have. We fight every day, Malfoy. Last night was different. The room felt like a vacuum, and Hermione would swear She actually felt the air being dragged out of her lungs. Draco's eyes looked softer then, like milky smoke, and she was completely fixated on them. After his infuriated rant last night, an outright denial of their demi-kiss, his words had completely thrown her. They both knew what he was referring to when he said, different and it crackled between them like dangerous flames, too hot to touch, but too powerful to ignore. The kiss. I wouldn't have you go hungry because of that. She broke the silence awkwardly. That would just be cruel. It would be normal, he argued, and she watched with disappointment as his features returned to the bitter, and sharp scowl she knew so well. And I'm sure right about now you want to lecture me with some tedious Gryffindor morale about kindness or some shit, but I really couldn't give a fuck. You're the one that asked me the question, she protested, tugging her free wrist from his hold and walking away from him. I'm going to bed. Good night, Malfoy. Draco clenched his fists as Granger disappeared into her room, wondering what the hell had caused him to act so pathetically. It was humiliating and just unacceptable, and he blamed her wholeheartedly for it. 
From the moment she had infected him with her muddy blood and swarmed him with her scent, everything had deteriorated, specifically his mind. And now he was being subjected to haunting fantasies of her and tempted by almost kisses that left him feeling both revolted and yet starved. It was breaking his brain into disturbing little fragments that made him question himself. How far was he willing to go before his inappropriate craving for her taste was sated? The rage he had felt when that sodding raven claw had showed up had been vicious and explosive, and Draco had physically quaked from it, but he had no idea why. It's not jealousy. Just rage. Possessive rage, maybe. But it's not jealousy. His luxuries and stimulants were limited in this prison, and her taste and scent had somehow become some of those needs, and he would not share them with anyone beyond that door. While his taste for her had been brief, It was now his. Even if he never wanted it again for the sake of his dignity, and he didn't want to touch her again. Really, he he didn't. But if Michael Twatty Corner thought he was entitled to a lick of Granger, he was fucking mistaken. Draco didn't understand his dangerous emotions towards her, nor did he like them but they were powerful, almost instinctive, and impossible to ignore. He stormed back to his room and silently pleaded with Salazar that he would be rid of his obsession with the mudblood soon. It was degrading and mind-sucking, and he feared he would act on it again. I will not act on it. The wind was screaming like tortured toddlers tonight, and Hermione was convinced her clock was lying. If it really was three in the morning, then she had been staring blankly at her ceiling for four hours, and that just wasn't healthy. She had secluded herself in her room and adamantly refused to leave, amusing herself with finishing every essay that was due from now until Christmas. That had lasted for three hours, and since then, she tried desperately to manage some sleep. But it was all in vain. And it wasn't the wind tonight. No matter how hard she tried to eradicate Malfoy from her mind, she couldn't. Be it stubborn flashbacks to their pseudo-kiss, or just general musings about his behavior, she found herself fascinated by him as much as she tried to reject it, and she noticed he refrained from calling her mudblood for a while. Only a month in his presence had affected her, and she found herself more determined than ever to tackle his prejudices. although. She couldn't help but wonder if it was now for him or for selfish purposes. She wanted him to view her differently, and she was fairly certain he was starting to. At least, she hoped he was. She sat up and rubbed her face with her palms, wondering if her interest in him was really appropriate or healthy at this point. Probably not. A shiver chased up her spine, and she grabbed her wand to renew her warming charm when a thought stole her attention. She had three blankets and magic to battle the November chill. But what did Draco have? He'd only been supplied with one blanket. He must have been freezing. She realized then that she actually cared when she really really shouldn't have. She knew it was in her nature, but this, this was something else. 
a genuine concern for his comfort that left her questioning when she started to actually care about him. She left her bed and wrapped herself in her bathrobe, trying to decide what exactly she should do. The options were simple. Choose to ignore it and let the cocky Pratt deal with it himself, or yield to her desire to provide him with some warmth. What the hell am I doing? She whispered to herself as she crept lightly out of her room. With at least two minutes of hesitation outside of his door, she swallowed away her nerves and angled her wand in its direction, whispering Alohomora. This has been an unabridged audio chapter of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. A special thank you goes out to Bex Chan for allowing me the privilege to read her story. To recommend your favorite Harry Potter fanfiction for future audiobook episodes, please visit Fox Fix Facebook page and Instagram through the links located in our description below. You can also help support us with donations through our PayPal account to help produce and shape in our future narrated fanfictions. Thank you for listening. Please join us next week for a continuation of this magical fanfiction. See you then!